Welcome back, everyone, to the Paladin Archives. I hope you had a good month. I missed you. My name is Mason Kren. I'm a Mason with the Paladin Order, a clandestine group dedicated to surveillance and policing of supernatural forces, from pixies to poltergeist, from werewolves to wendigos. If it goes bump in the night or day, we handle it so you don't have to acknowledge the existential terror that the world is filled with unknown monsters cultivated from the depths of your nightmares, all dedicated to cloaking the world in an everlasting darkness which even the bravest of angels would fear to tread, clawing at your psyche and soul and forcing you to confront your worst fears that perhaps the universe is an uncaring, unmoving thing that regards you not. Or, perhaps even worse, that there is indeed a god, and he wants you to suffer. You know, normal spooky stuff. Today, you're in for a treat, because it's once again time for... Monster Menagerie! Yes, our series that explores monsters and lays out the hypothetical battle strategy that the Paladin Order might utilize against them. So far this year, we've seen the OG vamp himself, Count Dracula from the 1931 film, Edward Cullen, Lady Domitresk, and even... Uh, Morbius. But today, I get to make up for last month. I consider it a treat after eating my vegetables. My, uh, really... Gross, slimy vegetables. Uh, anyway, forget about Morbius because this month it's the one, the only, my bae, Marceline the Vampire Queen. Woo! Oh man, I'm excited. Uh, but before I get too deep, let me just share my obligatory pleas for your love and attention. Ahem. If you like what we do here at the Paladin Archives, please consider leaving us a like and clicking that subscribe button. Hit that bell to make sure you never miss an episode of me overanalyzing vampires. Check us out on Twitter. Catch me over on Twitch. And most of all, if you really like the world of the Paladin Archives, make sure you hit up MatthiasTautimus.com. There you can see the first three chapters of writer Matthias Tautimus' debut novel, The Paladin. The story of a young man named Jonathan Sutter, a priest in training who loses his mentor to the powers of hell. Lost and alone, he's taken in by the Paladin Order, who offer him a path toward retribution. One part Dresden Files, one part SCP, with dark humor and a tinge of horror, and a lot of intrigue. Check out the first three chapters at MatthiasTautimus.com, along with some really cool art and, if I may humbly suggest, the first chapter of book two. It doesn't spoil a thing for book one, and it still gives you a wonderful feeling for the world of the Paladin. Okay, I think that's enough shilling. I better get back to simping, or, uh, analyzing with a critical mind. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. Grab your parasol and your SPF 10, thousand, and let's get started on Marceline the Vampire Queen. Algebraic. Marceline, is it just you and me in the wreckage of the world? That must be so confusing for a little girl. Okay, so normally I wouldn't even bother with this because most everything I review is older, but Adventure Time is different. I'm gonna go ahead and hit our new button for Spoiler Warnings. I have a feeling no one cared about spoilers for Morbius. Lady Damatresk was crawling all over the internet. Everyone knows Edward Cullen sparkles and Dracula. I mean, come on, it's Dracula. He's literally the OG vampire for most ideas of what that even means in fiction. But Adventure Time is a long show with very complicated lore. The stuff I say about Marceline might actually spoil some of your viewing of the show, and man, there's a lot of emotional moments to it. So if you haven't watched it, this is your warning, okay? Okay. Marceline Abadir was born right around the time of the Great Mushroom War, a war that literally knocked a chunk of the Earth right off. It was a nuclear war that turned everything into Fallout 3, basically. Little Marcy was, somehow, the child of a human woman and a demon named Hudson Aberdeer, the Lord of the Nidosphere. More on him in that crazy place later. 
Marcy was a half demon, which gave her skin a gray tone, gave her little fangs, and the ability to suck souls. She and her mother wandered the wasteland for a few years until she was maybe five, six? Right around then, her mother, who was dying from an undisclosed illness, possibly something to do with exposure to radiation, made the ultimate sacrifice and sent Marcy ahead to a shelter she knew would protect her daughter while she lay dying in a dusty old garage. Jeez, I'm only 800 words in and I'm already about to cry. Pull it together, Kren. Anyway, uh, she was found by, and uh, this is another big spoiler, guys. Three, two, one. Simon Petrikov, who would later be known as the Ice King. He found the crown that would give him ice powers and used it to keep himself alive as well as protect Marceline from the horrible abominations of the wasteland. Unfortunately, it drove him literally insane with each use, forcing him to make a sacrifice not unlike her mother, and also find a way to make me frigging cry from hearing someone sing the theme to Cheers. Dun, da -da 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 -dun -dun. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got! Messed up flex, guys. Not cool. It looks like this is where she first met what would later congeal into Princess Bubblegum years later. I get some real Mushroom King from the live-action Mario Brothers movie vibes from her. She lived for what is insinuated to be several hundred years on her own, with little in the way of friends. Apparently during this time, vampires became, like, uh, a thing? <laughs> So, being that they killed humans, a very endangered species during this time, she became a vampire hunter. During this period of her life, she gained the abilities that made her the Marceline we know and love at the beginning of the show. Each time she killed one of the vampire lords, she sucked their soul and gained their power. The only problem was the final vampire, the Vampire King, managed to bite and infect her during their battle. Thus. Marceline the Vampire Queen was born, uh, er, turned? After the reign of the vampires ended, she bummed around Ooh, leaving her mark on several homes that would later annoy Finn and Jake, dated Princess Bonabelle Bubblegum, and was overall an awesome girl. She took possession of her father's axe at some point, dated a really stupid wizard. You're not a genius. You're not a genius. Became known as a singing sensation across the land, and apparently joined a gang in the underworld, which is very separate from the Nightosphere. Speaking of the Nightosphere, let's take a brief look at her dad, Hunson Aberdeer. While this isn't about him, he played a big role in her life. He's the ruler of the Nightosphere, a, a really twisted realm that might be an analog for hell, maybe? Uh, but either way, he seemed to be absent from her life when she was young. At least, Marcy and her mom being on the brink of death seems to imply that. At some point, they reconciled, at least a bit, but it all fell apart when he committed the worst sin a father can commit. He ate her fries. But I'm Daddy, why did you eat my fries? I bought them, and they were mine. Daddy, why did you eat my fries? This drove a wedge between them for years, until Finn the Human reconciled the pair. They had a better relationship from that point on, but Hunson continued to push for her to take over as the head of the Nidosphere. Marceline, why are you so mean? I'm not mean, I'm a thousand years old, and I just lost track of my moral code. Despite the pretty chill girl she was by the end of the series, Marceline is initially introduced as a very selfish and self-centered person. She loves attention, loves the accolades of her adoring fans, but she also loves making people miserable. She goes out of her way to force Finn and Jake from several homes, knowing that they're scared of her and have no recourse but to wander ooh, cold and homeless. If her song in the episode Evicted is to be believed, it's less that she's cruel and more that she's become so detached from humanity and her own moral code that she doesn't really care. This changes over the course of the series, with her growing closer and closer to Finn and Jake and reconciling with Bubblegum, but for the most part, she's still pretty reckless and carefree. The longer she spends with Finn and Jake, the more she seems to gain, or regain perhaps, her sense of empathy. For instance, she's a huge fan of practical jokes, 
and in the episode Heat Signature, she and some ghost friends trick Finn and Jake into thinking she turned them into vampires. She goes along with it until the ghosts nearly get the pair killed, unwilling to actually let them hurt her friends. We see something similar in the episode Henchman, where she tricks Finn into becoming her loyal servant. She makes him think he's doing horrible things, but in the end, everything she has him do is twisted around and doesn't actually hurt anyone. How might she feel about paladins? <laughs> Honestly, best case scenario? She'd probably resent them as lame authority figures. Worst case? She'd consider them monster hunters that need to be put in their place. She's a cool girl, like, the coolest guys, but I feel like she'd probably not get along with most paladins, just on the principle of it. Oh, I, I wonder how she'd feel about masons. Don't you know I'm a villain? Every night I'm out killing, sending everyone running like children. I know why you're mad at me. I've got demon eyes, and they're looking right through your anatomy. That song counts. M Marceline technically wrote it. Okay, so remember how we spent like almost 10 minutes going over Edward's list of powers? Well, Marceline has him beat. The girl has, like, all the powers. J just starting off as a half-demon, she's long-lived. She lives well over a thousand years in the farm world timeline where she never got turned into a vampire. And she can suck souls, a trait she inherited from her dad. Stomping on and sucking their souls. Stomping on and soul, soul, soul. Goes up. <laughs> to get it out of the way, since it's the thing I most commonly try to measure, her strength is... Uh, variable. It seems to depend on her form, so I'm not sure we'll get a good measure of it. In her normal form, she doesn't seem to be too much stronger than an average human. But in one of her myriads of other forms, well, she's at least strong enough to hold back other giant monsters. Unfortunately, since I can't gauge their strength, I can't really gauge hers. I'll say she's at least strong enough to easily toss around a human, average of about 130 pounds, 80 kilograms, without effort in most of her transformations. Don't mistake her lack of boulder tossing as being any less dangerous than the rest of the vampires on our list. Let me just run down a quick list of the powers I could confirm. Honestly, I probably missed a few. Flight. Pyrokinesis. Fire resistance, she uh, fooled around in the Fire Kingdom, a place that is literally on fire. Transformation into a myriad of forms, including a giant bat, a werewolf-looking thing, a horned lizard demon, and my favorite, a large, tentacled, eldritch abomination. As stated before, she can suck souls, she can turn invisible, she can heal herself, which is huge, she can use telekinesis, she can use red rays of light that curl up her target's arms like freaking fruit roll-ups. She can transform or grow just parts of her body. She can freely open up portals to the nidosphere. Oh, and did I forget to mention, she can literally raise the freaking dead? Uh, and we can't forget her last but most iconic ability, the power of the axe. Both literally and figuratively, Marcy wields a mighty axe she's converted into a base. It was apparently a family heirloom left to her by our father. And I mean literally left to her. He just stabbed it in the floor of her hovel and forgot about it. Marceline! Long time no see. Some goober with glasses summoned me. What's that thing? Just gonna put this here, okay? Now let's go suck some souls! She uses it both to play some frickin' awesome tunes and battle her foes. Though her technique is a bit, uh, lacking? Uh, she mostly just berserks without any real style or strategy. But that's okay. When you're Marceline, you don't need strategy. Man, with a list like that, this might have to be escalated to higher levels. I'm afraid standard level parish paladins might not be enough for someone like Marcy. But there's hope, because along with all those powers come her weaknesses. First off, sunlight. It varies, but it seems like enough direct exposure to sunlight will kill Marceline. She describes the feeling as, quote, skinning her knee, and that she kind of likes it. But at the same time, in the second episode of the Stakes miniseries about her vampire heritage, she's tied to a windmill to be executed by the morning sun. She seems quite convinced she's going to die. She can usually prevent this by wearing SPF 10,000 sunblock or, you know, wearing gloves and shady hats. Next, 
she has to take in red. Uh, and unlike my last episode with Morbius, ugh, I, I don't mean blood, I literally mean the color red. Uh, don't get me wrong, she can drink blood, but she can also just drain the color red from people and objects and get the same benefit. Deprived of this, however, she slowly turns feral and presumably will die. Granted, I'm assuming that last part. Apparently, she can't beat ghosts? We learn in Heat Signature that it's a, a rock-paper-scissors kind of thing, which, I mean, I want to know what the last third of that triangle is. What is the other third of the ghost-vampire triad? Who has werewolves and wizards, but Adventure Time is weird. It, it could be ants. Ants could beat ghosts in Adventure Time. I don't know. Also, uh, she can't digest syrup, something I'm sure paladins will be able to exploit to great effect. I'm gonna bury you in the ground. I'm gonna bury you with my sound. Let's take a look at Marceline's whole makeup and see if we can understand her a little better. She does have fangs, uh, but not because she's a vampire. In episodes with Little Marcy, you can clearly see that before she was turned, she had them. Double checking with her papa, Hunts and Aberdeer, you can clearly see it's a demon trait. Which, uh, makes me wonder, her being part demon, how is that going to factor into all of this? Oh well, better save that for containment strategies. She has pale gray skin and Ever since she was turned, two little bite marks on her neck where the Vampire King got her. She can't tolerate the sun without long clothing and hats or some special sunscreen. This is bad enough, she got trapped under a tree once and had no choice but to uproot the tree and take it with her. She also needs to drink the color red to survive, or else she turns feral and hunts for blood. This is actually really weird. I mean, it's adventure time, so everything is weird, but... I have no idea how I'd include this in a paladin report. Do not wear the color red, she might drink it. Like, I have no idea how I'd explain this to a paladin going after her. What we actually see is that she takes objects that are red, dips her fangs in like Capri Sun straws, and literally drains the red color out, leaving most objects a, a dreary gray. Though she did give one man a swanky white bow tie. Apparently she can make do with pink in a pinch. Uh, the physics of this are a little confusing. I'm, I'm not sure how she's drinking color. And we can't just say it's pigment because there's a big difference between pigment and color. She's draining the color out of things that don't have pigment. Color is the visual interpretation of light bouncing off of objects. Draining the color red, it's like saying she's drinking a sound. There's not an actual thing for her to drink, not a physical substance that makes all things red. Uh, sure, dyes and pigments can turn things red, but based on what we're seeing, it's literally the color. Like, if I ground up a bunch of red pigment to add to, say, like a painting, she could drain the red from the pigment. Do you understand what I'm saying? Marceline is warping our very perception of light by dipping her fangs in things. What is she drinking? You look so cute sitting in your bow. I want to suck out your eyeballs and rip out your throat. I want to suck out your eyeballs and rip out your throat. That song's about a fisherman. So, if you don't remember what this part is, a big part of my job as a mason is to give paladins quick, concise ideas of the danger they're facing. Part of that is the subjective paladin threat level. So far, Dracula was a 2, because I refuse to let him be a 1, Edward and Dumitrescu were 3s, and Morbius uh, was a solid 4. 4s are big news, guys. I know the scale goes to 10, but it's weighted toward the bottom. A 1 on this scale would be like um, Mrs. Fillmore's chinchilla getting possessed by her late husband and rampaging through the cul-de-sac. A 10 might be more like uh, the living void that sleeps within the center of the polar ice sheets, awakening and beginning its decade-long feast of souls starting with Iceland. 
Well, actually it might be a 9, but I'm sure it would be a 10 to the good people of Iceland. <sighs> okay guys, so looking this over, a Marceline has the potential to be the most dangerous vampire we've had. I'm not even bothering to contemplate her full demon pendant nidosphere version because, I mean, forget that. Just Marceline as she appears in 90% of the episodes is plenty dangerous. Her transformations, her, her pyro and telekinesis, and most of all, her ability to raise the dead are, are big things I'm worried about. Not to mention, she'll be doing it while she's invisible. I mean, all that alone could spell the end for most paladins. Oh, oh, <laughs> and those lasers, of course, that roll up your arms. <sighs> I think she has the potential to do some serious damage. It's true that her sensitivity to daylight is easy to exploit, but she's no Dracula. She can move, adjust, and otherwise limit the danger sunlight poses to her. As you might recall, I gave Dracula a paladin threat level of 2, but if he hadn't had that weakness, I might have brought it up to a 3 just based on his strength. I'm not sure if Marceline is that strong, but she wouldn't need to be. She can torture you with laser beams, uh, transform into hideous creatures, and I don't know if I stress this enough, but she can raise the freaking dead. Oh, uh, and do it all while invisible, so, you know, there's that. Okay, uh, I'm very hesitant to do this. I, I don't want to be accused of favoritism or bias against Morbius for holding the highest threat level, but if Morbius is a solid four, I feel like Marceline is a bigger threat than that. He has speed and strength, and he can avoid capture, but she can transform into a huge beast, control fire, use telekinesis, force your body to curl up, uh, and of course, raise the dead. Boom, Marceline the Vampire Queen is Paladin Threat Level 5. I think local parish paladins will have to sit this out. We're going to need to call in the stewardship paladins. Phew, contain Marceline, huh? Okay, uh, let's consider our options. There's a, a lot to go over, so let's break it down into some sections. First option, negotiation. Like some of our other vampires, there's a pretty good chance she'll negotiate. But strangely, I think unlike Morbius and Edward, getting a gentle, earnest paladin to talk with her might not work as well as an irreverent one. As I mentioned before, she tends to have an aversion to authority figures, so choosing the paladin to negotiate with her will be... difficult. Strangely, uh, I think I might know a few choice paladins who might work better than others, begrudgingly. But uh, that aside, let's take a look at the scenario where she's not willing to talk. Next up, her weaknesses. She's dangerous. But she's also a goof. In episode 1 of the Stakes miniseries, she gets stuck under a tree, unable to reach her umbrella in the sun. She only has enough sunblock for her hand. The fact that she's in this position shows if she's vulnerable to anything, it's her own carelessness. Assuming Marceline isn't aware she's being hunted by paladins, she might actually end up trapping herself. So, constant surveillance. Wait for her to donk up, as she might say, and end up in a bad situation. We might be able to trick her into exposing herself to sunlight, or perhaps more likely get her trapped someplace. If we can set up an attractive place for her to hide during the day, something we can control, maybe we can trap her and slowly peel it away, limiting her escape options. Next up is combat. Assuming she's onto us, she'll take steps to avoid us. So what can we use? Well, let's look at what took down her vampire predecessors. Stakes. Pierce her heart and she's toast. Not too hard if she's unaware, but in the middle of a fight, eh, she's got a lot of things to strike back with. We'll probably need crossbows with stake bolts. Fire has no effect and I have little hope for tasing her. Sonic attacks. She seems to play by some demon rules, but the rules of demons in fiction are so variable that our rules may not work. Still, I guess we could try to see if we can exercise her. 
though that means someone has to lay hands on her. I wonder, would that just send her back to the Nidosphere? Since she can move freely to and from there, it would only be kicking the can down the road. Maybe in a pinch, if you have no other options. I'm not actually too worried about Marceline's axe. Honestly, she's done a lot more damage playing it than swinging it. But if she goes full monster, then we've got a problem. Local parish paladins aren't equipped to take something that large down. Not normally, anyway. She can change shape and size, so trying to hit her with manacles or chains is a no-go. We'll have to equip everyone with heavy vestments to hopefully protect from her claws and teeth. I know she can heal herself, she got that from Sister Moon, so whatever we do has to be done quickly and decisively. It'd be very easy for her to just turn invisible and escape to go recover somewhere else. Honestly, my only thought is overwhelming force. Track her, wait for a good opportunity, and maybe hope she screws up and isolates herself. Then send in the stewardship paladins, maybe with support from a couple of parish paladin groups. Big monster or normal form, hit her with numbers. I I'm talking mafia hit kind of numbers. Man, this is gonna be hard to cover up. Okay, first recommendation, negotiate. Choose your spokesperson wisely as she doesn't respect authority figures. Second recommendation, hit her in the feels. Marceline is an emotional creature with a lot of scars. Psychological attacks may distract or weaken her long enough to use standard neutralization methods. Third recommendation, overwhelming force. Her few weaknesses aren't easy to reliably exploit. Monitor her closely, hope that her careless nature sets her up for your attack. Whether she does or not, hit her with everything, all at once. This job should be led by stewardship paladins supported by local parish paladins. Let's go in the garden. You'll find something waiting right there where you left it lying upside down. Okay, wow, that was a trip. When you see the individual things Marceline's capable of, it's hard not to think about how dangerous she could be. Fortunately, she's a chill girl, and since she doesn't drink blood, I have a hard time coming up with a reason for the paladins to actually bother her. I might be able to come up with a few reasons for a mason to bother her, though. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little look at Marcy. Honestly, the best part of researching her was listening to all those amazing songs. Did you realize they wrote and performed full, awesome songs for the Nintendo DS? They had an Adventure Time game. It had some amazing stuff on it. And we all missed out by not playing Hey Ice King, Why'd You Steal Our Garbage? Well, either way, how do you think she stacks up against the likes of Dracula, Edward Cullen, Lady Domitresque, and Michael Morbius? I think you can tell who my favorite so far is, but I want to hear yours. Let me know down in the comments. What did I get wrong? What did I forget? Does Marcy really deserve a threat level 5? And if you're really enjoying that, remember, at the end of the year, we're stacking all our vampires against each other to figure out which one is the most vampire-y vampire of them all. Stick around to make sure you get to vote. If you like this whole silly thing and want to know more about the world of the Paladin Archives, please stop by MatthiasTautimas.com to check out the debut novel, The Paladin. It's funny, it's a little spooky, it's a little dark, but I know you'll love the intrigue and the awesome characters, like Jonathan, or maybe his paladin boss, Regan, oh, or perhaps the dynamic duo of paladin Samantha Aaron and Mason Katie Hooper. A big thanks to Prissy for all the amazing art. There's that and more waiting at the website. Don't forget to check us out on Twitch, send us some love at Twitter, and of course, if you like this and want to see more, like, subscribe, and hit that bell. Oh man, I have Marceline's soundtrack just going through my head. I gotta get going or this is gonna turn into karaoke night at the archives. Until next time, keep your eyes peeled. 
you never know what's hiding out there. Best Marceline song. Go. The other day, you used my brush. It was okay. I didn't mind. Ha <laughs> ha.